and cast them upon Jesus. Behold, gaze upon the Lamb of God. See Jesus as everything. Secondly, look at verse 41. We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. You do realize, of course, that Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? It's not like Bob Flayhart and then Jesus Christ, right? Christ means the Messiah. The Messiah means the anointed one. We're to see Jesus as the only one whom God has chosen to save the world. There is no Savior besides Jesus. All of the other religions are idolatries. There's only one who's been anointed. That's what Christ means. And in Christ are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus, we find every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. He's the anointed one. Do you see Jesus as your everything? Thirdly, verse 45, he's the one Moses wrote about in the law. The, the law uh, the, that Moses wrote, the first five books of the Bible. And as soon as humanity fell into sin in Genesis 3, God immediately promises Messiah. He says to the woman and to the serpent, Serpent, you shall bruise the seed of the woman's heel. But serpent, the seed of the woman, Jesus, will crush your head. Do you feel under attack? Do you feel hunted by evil? Do you sometimes feel powerless before sin? See Jesus as the one whom Moses wrote about, who will crush Satan's head. Romans says, under our feet. Fourthly, verse 45, he's called Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Those are his human titles, right? So Jesus here is revealed to us as human, as man. Man as man sinned, and man as man had to pay the penalty. Man as man must deliver to God perfect obedience. Jesus did that on our behalf. But also, Jesus as human encourages us that we have a faithful high priest. Because he was human, he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Do you see Jesus as one who is touched by your weaknesses? One who is touched by your trials? One who is touched by your struggles? See Jesus as everything. Fifth, verse 49. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. We just saw the human titles. This is the divine title. Jesus is not only human, he's also God. Fully man, fully God. And because he's God, his blood has infinite worth. And his blood, therefore, is able to be shed and cover the sin and shame of me and you and as many as whom God would call to himself. Because he's God, he's able to rescue you. Because he's God, he's able to deliver you. Trust him. See Jesus as your everything. Sixth, verse 49, he's the king of Israel. You know, Israel was looking for a political savior, and so often do we. There's no political savior out there, folks. There's no president or king or congress or court that's going to fix this world. There's only the king of Israel. His name is Jesus. And he is bringing the rule and reign of grace. He is bringing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Do you see Jesus as your everything? And then seventh, verse 51, he's the son of man. He has universal authority. This is a title from Daniel chapter 7. It's Jesus' favorite self-designation. He is the king, the ruler of the universe, but he is also the Savior sent to save humanity. In this short passage, seven titles of Jesus that reveal him as everything to us. See, it's one thing to know about Jesus. It's one thing to know about God. It's a whole other thing altogether to see God. And only God can open our eyes. Remember the book of Job? By the way, it's one of our passages, Job 42, in the blue book this week. 
Uh, Job was going through incredible suffering, and he was trying to maintain his innocence before his friends that were saying, you're suffering because of sin. And Job was confused, and he cried out in frustration to God, God, why don't you vindicate me? At the end of the book, God shows up and says, okay, Job, buckle the chin strap, buck, because here we go. And God says, Job, where were you when I formed the word, world? Where, where were you? when I send the rain? Where were you when I formed the creatures? Where were you when I formed tornadoes? Where were you? And Job in verse 5 of chapter 42 says, my ear had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you, and I repent in dust and ashes. Folks, it's one thing to hear about God. All of us in here this morning, we've all heard about God. Hearing about God will not change your life. If like Isaiah in chapter 6 of his book, if you see God, it changes everything. Many of you know I'm a, a Chronicles of Narnia fan. As my kids grew up, I would read them the Chronicles. In Prince Caspian, uh, there's a scene between Aslan, who's the Christ figure, uh, of the great lion of this magical world, Narnia, and there's a girl named Lucy who's from our world that gets into Narnia. And she's with her friends, but everybody's asleep, and Lucy hears some noises in the woods. And she gets up and she goes to a clearing. And in that clearing is Aslan, but he's, he's bigger than she remembers. And she says, Aslan, is it really you? you? You look so different. You're so much bigger than you were before. And Aslan says, my child, I am no bigger. It's just because you're older. And Lucy says, you're not any bigger? And Aslan speaks these words, I am no bigger, but every year you grow you will find me bigger. Is your Jesus bigger this year than he was last year? Is, is your Jesus bigger this month than he was last month? Is your Jesus bigger today than he was yesterday? See, the bigger your Jesus is, the bigger will be your love for Jesus. And the converse is also true. The smaller your Jesus is to you, the smaller will be your love for him. Would you see Jesus as your everything? Study the titles. Study the names of God. Reflect on the scriptures. Ask God to open your eyes to see Jesus as your everything. And then secondly, see yourself as seen. We don't need to just see Jesus as everything. We need to see ourselves as, as seen. Look at verse 38. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? Christ sees you in your hunger, in your curiosity, even in your weak need faith. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just a seeker. You're not sure what you think about this whole Jesus thing. Jesus sees you in your searching, and he doesn't turn you away. Jesus said, whoever seeks me, I will never turn away. Verse 39, he says, come, and you will see. He asks where they're, they, they ask him where he's staying, and he says, come, and you will see. He's a welcoming Savior. He's, he's filled with invitation. And so how do you see yourself in light of these verses? See yourself as an object of mercy. See yourself as an object of delight. Jesus is interested in you. He's interested in you seeking him. Look at verse 42, when Jesus meets Peter. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. What do we get out of that? You need to see yourself as personally and intimately recognized by Jesus. He knows your name. 
You know what it's like to have your name called by someone who loves you? Jesus calls your name. He knows you. He knows you intimately. He knows you personally. He knows you as if you were the only person to be known. Look at verse 42. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, which means rock. He gave Peter a new name. Everyone who knows Jesus, Jesus gives a new name. See, you are seen by Jesus according to your identity in Jesus. You are seen by God according to your position in Christ. You are seen as if you had been as perfectly obedient as Jesus was obedient for you. You are seen as if you have never disobeyed one of God's commands. Because you are seen in light of your new name, your position in Christ. Look at verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. For most of my life I have seen myself as the one who's seeking God and God playing hard to get and hide to seek with me. Jesus found Philip. How do you see yourself? See yourself as pursued in love by God. Can I say that again? See yourself as pursued by God in love. What's it feel like to be pursued? Think of friends that reach out to you to pursue you. The God of the universe pursues you. He wants to know you. Then look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael and said, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now think about this. Is that the whole truth about Nathanael? Of course not. Nathanael was broken and sinful just like you and I. But Jesus chose to focus on the best thing that he saw in Nathanael. You see, you need to see yourself in Christ as seen through the eyes of grace. Jesus sees the best there is to see about you and delights in you. And then verse 48, Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. You need to see yourself as seen in every circumstance, in every situation, in every bit of trouble, in every trial. One of my favorite passages about being seen is in the book of Genesis. You all know the story of Abraham and Sarah, right? And God appeared to Abraham and said, I will bless all the nations through you. I will give you a child. Well, Abraham and Sarah have been trying for years to have children. They weren't able to. But God said, I will supernaturally enable you and Sarah to have a child by my grace, by my power. Well, 25 years later, there was still no child. Well, the fact of the matter is Abraham and Sarah got tired of trusting and started trying. You ever struggle with that? Abraham and Sarah got tired of trusting, so they started trying. They they resorted to human ingenuity. They resorted to solely human resources. And they stopped trusting the promise. They stopped trusting the supernatural and put their hope in the natural. So they said, hey, here's Hagar. Hagar was Sarah's handmaid. Legally in those days, if Abraham went into a handmaiden, then legally that child would be Abraham and Sarah's. So maybe they're thinking God wants us to do this. So we always get in trouble when we leave the promise and turn to human effort. Sure enough, Hagar did get pregnant, had a son named Ishmael, but he was not the promised son. He was the son that came about by human ingenuity and human effort and human resource and human recourse. He wasn't the child of the promise. He was the child of human effort. And it caused all kinds of problems. Sarah immediately despised Hagar. 
and said, Abraham, throw her out. So Hagar and her little infant son were cast out. And they were about to die. And Hagar starts weeping and prays. And God appeared to her and said, Hagar, I see you. And I see your son. And I will bless you. And I will bless him. But he's not the promised child. But I'll still bless you. And Hagar gets up and says, You are the God who sees me. How do you stay faithful? How do you trust God when you're facing the flames of the furnace? You see yourself as being seen. You you see God enough to know he's able. You see God enough to know he can. And you see yourself as seen and known and cared for. And you say, God, I will trust you. Even if even if. See Jesus as your everything. See yourself as seen. And then thirdly and finally, see life as discipleship. See, if you see Jesus and you see yourself as seen, it will lead to a response. It has to. In our blue book this week, there's a reflection, and it goes like this. The hardest thing about really seeing is when you really have to do something about what you've seen. You won't forget that one, will you? The hardest thing about really seeing is when you have to really do something about what you've seen. See, the Christian life isn't knowing about God. The Christian life isn't knowing that you're seen necessarily by itself. It is seeing Jesus as your everything, seeing that you're seen, and then seeing life as discipleship. Knowing that you're seen comes with a call. Look at verse 37. The two disciples heard John the Baptist say this, and they followed Jesus. Disciplers are followers of Jesus. Verse 43, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Discipleship is following Christ in trust. Following Christ in surrender. Following Christ in submission. Following Christ in obedience. And following Christ in service. What's Jesus calling you to follow him in right now? That you are resisting. Where is Jesus calling you to follow him? And you're not sure you want to. See, if you see Jesus in all of his beauty and see yourself as seen by God's love, it will melt your heart. It will move your will. And you will follow him. But discipleship isn't really following Jesus. It's also making Jesus known to others who will follow Jesus. Look at verse 41. The first thing Andrew did was find his own brother and said to him, we've found the Messiah. People who experience grace express grace. People who experience grace express grace. If you've been found by Jesus and seen by him, then you in turn are called to find others and point them to Jesus as well. Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Verse 45, Jesus found Philip and Philip found Nathanael. John the Baptist pointed Andrew to Jesus and Andrew pointed his brother to Jesus. Jesus found Philip and Philip found Nathanael and pointed him to Jesus. When we see Jesus as our everything and see ourselves as seen by God, it melts our hearts and moves our will so that we follow Christ, submit to Christ, surrender to Christ, serve Christ, obey Christ, and point others to Christ. Again, John is making a theological point here. He is saying when you're seen by Jesus and you see Jesus, 
you will help others see Jesus. That's why our mission at this church is engaging every neighbor with the surprising power of grace. And one of our strategies is to show grace to all, the least and the lost. Over the fence of our neighbor's backyard, over the mountain into the city of Birmingham, and overseas into the world. See, discipleship is simply seeing Jesus more and more and more and more and more and more. That's all discipleship is, seeing Jesus more and more and more and more and more. I love the story about a, a, a little boy and his grandfather. His grandfather was very old, but the little boy loved spending time with him. And one of the things they loved to do was go out on the pond behind the grandfather's house and fish. So they were fishing together one day, and the, the little boy looked at his grandfather and said, Grandpa, can you see God? And immediately the grandfather was lost in thought, and the little boy wasn't aware enough to know what was going on. He thought maybe his grandpa didn't hear him, so he said, hey, grandpa, can you see God? He turned to his grandson and said, it's getting these days that I really don't see anything else. You see, that's discipleship. Seeing Jesus more and more and more and more and more. And seeing yourself as seen and loved and protected and cared for and delighted in. And so seeing Jesus and so recognize you're being seen that your heart melts, your will is moved, you love Jesus more, and you tell others about him as well. Now here's, here's the trick. Seeing Jesus is supernatural. I, I love the story in Luke 24, uh, after the resurrection, there's two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they're talking amongst themselves about what happened with the crucifixion and what happened as far as the women telling people that Jesus rose from the dead. And the text tells us that Jesus came and walked alongside of them. But the text says, their eyes were prevented from seeing him. And he talked with them about from the scriptures, they all pointed to Jesus. And then they sat down for dinner. And the text tells us that during dinner, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And when he broke it, the eyes of the disciples were opened. They recognized they were with Jesus and poof, Jesus was taken from their sight just like that. The, the point is, clearly Luke is wanting us to think of the supper when Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Eat in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the remissions of sins of many. Drink from it, all of you, and be thankful. See, the, the point of the sacrament here is that we get to see Jesus. We, we see him as the Lamb of God, right? His, his body broken, his blood spilt, who takes away our sin. We see him as the welcoming Savior that sees us and says, come and dine with me, sup with me, drink with me. I delight in you. And we see Jesus as the coming king. We're, we're to do this in remembrance of him until he comes. This is not Oak Mountain's table. This is a table for every believer in Christ. But it's a supernatural table. It actually is a table that as we break the bread, God opens our eyes. And so that's why Paul says, don't come to this table in an unworthy fashion because it's not a symbol. Too many churches just teach this is a symbol. A symbol can't make you sick. A symbol can't make people die. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, because people have come to the table in an unworthy manner, the power of this table is there to bless and there to discipline. Now, I don't say that to scare you. I say that to urge you to repentance. This is a table for sinners. So come admitting your sin and asking God for sight. Let's pray. Father, we set apart these common elements from their common use. They remain bread and they remain the fruit of the vine. And yet, you tell us in 1 Corinthians 11 that they are means of grace through which we experience supernatural power. And Father, the power we need today is sight. Help us to see and help us to see ourselves as seen. 
and help us to point other people to Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. At Oak Mountain, uh, we do this very simply. It's two cups. You just twist and spin. You'll have both elements. Uh, Please hold them until everyone's been served. Uh, We'll partake of the sacrament together. As the uh, elements are being distributed, let me just lead us on some reflection uh, through what we learned in our message. As you hold the elements, as you hold the bread and the cup, behold the Lamb of God. You feeling self-condemned, you feeling shame, you feeling guilt, behold the Lamb of God. As you hold the bread and the cup, see Jesus as the the anointed one, the one in whom every spiritual blessing in heaven on earth is found. If you have Jesus, you have everything. But, But your union with Christ is strengthened, and your awareness of your union with Christ, your position in Christ is strengthened as you eat and drink. The bread and the wine remind us of the body and blood, the one about whom Moses wrote about in the law. And as I said last week, just a reminder that our faith is reasonable. Prophecies hundreds of years before Jesus predicted his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. So as you hold the elements, reflect upon the reasonableness of our faith. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, how is Jesus' humanity a, a comfort to you this morning? Where do you need to know that he's touched by your weaknesses? He's touched by your troubles. But he's also the son of God. How great can your confidence be as you walk with Jesus that he can handle whatever you're experiencing. He's God. He's the King. Where do you need to see grace expand its rule in your life? The power of grace, the comfort of grace. He's the King of Israel, the one whose kingdom is coming. And He's the Son of Man. He rules the universe. And then pray, God, open my eyes. Because I don't need to just know about you, God. I need to see you. You can know about God and never be changed. You can know about God and never be changed. You can never see God and not be changed. You can never see God and not be changed. But to see God, He needs to open your eyes. How desperate are you to see Jesus? How big is your Jesus today? And then as you hold the elements, recognize that you're seen by God. He sees you. He calls you by name. He sees your circumstances. Just like Hagar, even if people have sinned against you, you're seen. Think about Nathaniel. The best thing about you is what Jesus chooses, chooses to see. I mean, he chooses to see, obviously, what's wrong with us. But he also chooses to see us in light of who he's making us to be. Think about that. He called Simon Kephas, which means Peter, which means rock. He chose to see Peter in light of who he was intending to make Peter to become. That's how you're seen. 
this morning. And that's all because of the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. You know what's funny about the passage? The disciples actually began to think that they were seeing when when they were barely beginning to see. And through through the entire life of Jesus' or the entire time of Jesus' ministry, the disciples kept on thinking that they were finally seeing. But they were really just beginning to see. Even after Jesus died, they still didn't see. And after Jesus rose, they still didn't see. And even after he ascended, They still had a hard time seeing, just like us. One of my favorite gospel accounts, it's crazy. There's a blind man. By the way, notice how many times Jesus gives sight to the blind. Because we're blind. And there's this dude who's blind. And Jesus spits. I mean, why? He could just say, see. He spits puts his hands on the guy's eye. Jesus says, tell me what you see. He says, well, I see, but I see people, they look like trees walking around. So Jesus spits again and puts his hands on the guy's eye again. And his sight was completely restored. Now, why? He's Jesus. Just open his eyes. No, I'm going to do it in a progressive healing manner. You know why that's in the scriptures? Because that's exactly how the Christian life works. We think we see, but we don't see. And then we see, and we think we see, but we don't see. And then we see, and we think we see. And then when we really get mature, we realize that we see and we don't see. And we need to see. And we want to see. And the blood of Christ has the power to give us sight. Drink in remembrance of him. In the blue book, Jim Branch has a reflection this week. I'm going to close with this as our prayer. Oh Lord, give me good eyes today that my soul may be filled with light rather than darkness. Love rather than my own need. Do not let my vision get clouded and distorted by the darkness that is around me or that is within me, but help my eyes to stay pure and clear, seeing as you see, that I might love as you love. Amen. Let's all stand here, the benediction. On Communion Sundays, we take up a special offering for those who are in need. If you're led, there'll be people at the door. Also, this is really key, uh, if you filled out that Blue Book survey, drop it in the baskets. If you did not get a weekly, please grab one and fill out that survey. Or if you don't have the survey, don't have time right now, go online, use the mobile app. Listen, we we really want to know if God is using our community, to help us engage Jesus in devotions. So please fill that out for us. Receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Abba Father who sees you even now. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Hey, one last thing. Our, our kiddos are actually getting ready to lead worship for Mother's Day. It's kind of become a tradition here at Oak Mountain. That's going to be Sunday, May 14th. They're rehearsing the next three Sundays, so tonight, 4.30 to 5.30. If you have a first grader through sixth grader that would like to help us lead in worship on Mother's Day, that's the next three Sunday nights, uh, 4.30 to 5.30, downstairs in the choir room. Let's close together this morning. He keeps you from stumbling, presents you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy. To the wise God, our Savior, be all dominion and glory and majesty and power forevermore, forevermore. Amen. 
you're dismissed. Have a great Lord's Day. We'll see you this afternoon, 4.30 for Kids Choir, 5.30 for The Rock Life Groups and Junior High.